Hey everyone, welcome back to Adhere and Apologetics. I'm so pumped that you're joining us today to have Dr. Eric Ritan. He's a professor of philosophy at Oklahoma State University. Eric, thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited for this conversation. Uh, we're gonna talk about like universalism and Christian universalism and whatnot. Uh, Eric, just to start things off, do you wanna talk a little bit about like who you are, like what you do, things like that? Sure. Um, as, as you already mentioned, I'm a philosophy professor at Oklahoma State University. Uh, I specialize in philosophy of religion and ethics. Um, my dissertation, oh, so many years ago, was on Christian ethics and um, issues of violence and nonviolence uh, within the context of the Christian love ethic. So um, an interest in the love ethic of Christianity has been a central driving theme of uh, my philosophical work uh, for my entire career. Um, and it um, first took me into the issue of punishment, um, where I was thinking, well, what um, would a, a love ethic say about punishment? What would be a, a, a form of punishment or a mode of punishment that fit with the love ethic? And that then led me to start thinking about um, uh, the doctrine of hell, uh, and, uh, you know, ideas about hell as, as a form of eternal punishment. And I immediately saw some tension between, uh, viewing hell as punishment and, um, and, uh, the love ethic as I had been developing it. And that sort of led me into a more and more of a deep dive into, um, the doctrine of hell, the doctrine of limited salvation more broadly, and the alternative universalism. And that ultimately um, took shape in um, uh, a book that came out in, in 2011, uh, God's Final Victory, which was co-authored between me and John Cronin, another philosopher of religion, um, in which we uh, uh, make the case for Christian universalism. Um, and also I just, last week turned into my publisher the manuscript for my my newest book which is broadly on the same topic but um explores the problem of heavenly grief which i may have a chance to talk about it's a in effect a challenge to uh the doctrine of limited salvation based on uh the grief that those in heaven would feel for the lost um, anyway, uh, so that's me. I've also uh, done a fair bit of uh, philosophical work in social and political philosophy and ethics. Um, I've uh, written on the problem of evil, and I wrote a book uh, responding to the new atheists. That was my first book called Is God a Delusion? Um, so uh, my interests are, are quite broad, but... Um, the, the largest bulk of my career the last 20 years has been on uh, uh, Christian soteriology, uh, the doctrine of hell, uh, to a lesser extent, annihilationism um, and universalism. So to get things started, Eric, and thank you for sharing that. Uh, broadly speaking, like what is Christian universalism? And maybe like share like what are some like common misconceptions people have about it? Yeah, so... Um, uh, Christian universalism, uh, first off, is Christian, and secondly, it's universalist. Uh, so what does it mean that it's universalist? Um, universalism is the doctrine uh, that all are ultimately saved. Uh, Christian universalism is the, the version of that doctrine that holds that all are saved on account of Christ's atoning work. Um, so uh, Christian universalism is a is a Christian uh, understanding of universalism or a universalist understanding of Christian theology, we might uh, say. And um, uh, one of the things <clears throat> a Christian universe, well, let me, there's so many confusions, so I'm trying to decide which to go with first. Um, first off, Christian universalism is not the same as religious pluralism, universalism and pluralism are distinct things, right? The universalist holds that all are saved. Um, uh, the pluralist holds that 
uh, like all religions are equally true or are comparable pathways to God or something like that. Uh, those are distinct uh, views. Um, you could have a pluralist uh, uh, who's a universalist, but you could have a non-universalist pluralist, right? Someone could think that all religious traditions are pathways to God, but uh, atheism is not a religious tradition and atheists follow no pathway to God and so are never saved, right? You could have non-universalist pluralists. And um, a Christian universalist um, uh, obviously think there's something special about Christianity, right? And so is not uh, a... A, a pluralist in that sense. Um, so, uh, so that's important to keep in mind, right? So a Christian universalist thinks, uh, embraces uh, Christianity, uh, but thinks that uh, Christ's atoning work um, uh, ultimately saves all, um, as opposed to being some pluralist doctrine, which is something different altogether. Um, the other th thing is uh, the Christian Universalist holds that all are ultimately saved. Um, so uh, Christian Universalism is compatible with some doctrine of hell, for example. Uh, what is not compatible with is the doctrine of eternal hell. Um, Christian Universalism uh, is likewise not compatible with a uh, doctrine of eternal annihilation or people being put out of existence eternally because that is inconsistent with them ultimately being saved. Um, so the Christian Universalist doesn't necessarily deny that there are post-mortem uh, costs to, um, to how we live our lives uh, uh, or the choices that we make or um, our rejection of of God's grace, uh, what the Christian Universalist holds is that those consequences are finite, uh, that uh, ultimately all will be saved. Um, how that precisely looks is going to vary depending on the Universalist. Um, in fact, my book um, uh, with John Cronin on God, God's Final Victory um, we um, uh, we had a kind of disjunctive argument, an either or argument, uh, uh, which basically sketched out two uh, versions of Christian universalism, depending on your uh, underlying assumptions about the way God's grace works. Um, so, uh, so there's not just one kind of universalism. Uh, the Christian Universalist is not committed to the idea that um, that everyone at the moment of death is ushered into heaven. Uh, the uh, the Christian Universalist does not think that, uh, for example, Adolf Hitler will enter heaven uh, in, as the Adolf Hitler we know, right? The Adolf Hitler that... Uh, we encounter in history could not possibly uh, be in heaven in that state of, of wickedness, right? And, uh, and so uh, the Christian Universalists would have to hold that some radical transformation occurs in uh, Adolf Hitler. We can talk more about uh, what that might look like uh, as our conversation evolves. Um, uh, but that ultimately saved, that ultimately is important, right? For, for not being confused about what uh, Christian Universalists uh, hold. Uh, okay, well, let me stop there because uh, I could go on and these, uh, I'm sure more details will come out as we, as we proceed. Yeah, for sure. And thank you for that, Eric. Uh, I'd love to at the end get in, like, go deeper into these uh, common misconceptions and whatnot. But like, let's talk a little bit about your story, Eric. Um, you talked about some of your early philosophical work. Um, what led you to universalism specifically? Like, how did you become a Christian universal? A Christian universal? A univers? Why can I not talk? Um, why are you a Christian universal? A universalist today? Yeah. So. Um... I already gestured a little bit towards this. Um, 
And I mean, my personal journey uh, is um, interwoven with my philosophical journey. But uh, if you ask me, what are my reasons for being a universalist today? Um, that's a bit different than how did I come to universalism? But let me sort of weave both of those things together a little bit. As I mentioned, I, um, um, my, my sort of earliest major philosophical work, my PhD dissertation was on Christian love uh, and violence. And I primarily focused on defensive violence, right? Uh, could defensive violence be justified uh, as an expression of Christian love? Um, but I spend a little bit of time on punitive violence, right? The, uh, um, you know, various forms of uh, violence that come under the heading of punishment. Um, and one thing that became uh, clear to me is that if we're really taking this love ethic seriously, uh, a love that uh, desires the good of the neighbor for the neighbor's own sake, uh, that... Um, uh, that does not wait on worth, right? That isn't contingent upon the person deserving uh, something or other. Um, uh, punitive violence um, would have to, and and the concept of justice would have to be uh, woven together in some meaningful way with the aims of love, right? And uh, given that uh, sin is a, corruption or vitiation of a person, it uh, makes sense that punitive justice, which is a response to uh, wrongdoing uh, or in the Christian context to sin, uh, could conceivably be construed as aiming at the good of uh, the one who is corrupted, right? Christianity has long held that virtue uh, is its own reward, right? That being a good human being uh, is not something that you uh, do to earn blessings. It is a blessing, right? Uh, and it is the ultimate blessing. Being uh, morally sanctified is the greatest gift of uh, heaven, right? Being morally sanctified, being purged of sin, uh, being um, uh, having one's cramped character transformed. Uh, the greatest joy of heaven is essentially bound up with our moral sanctification, right? Uh, uh, being morally sanctified is being in tune with the good. And uh, it's in being in tune with the good that we find true joy, right? And so uh, on this view, uh, sin is bad for us. Right, sin is terrible for us. It's a corruption of it. It's, it's uh, and um, uh, punitive violence is a response to sin. Uh, aims at curing us of a disease, right? The disease of sin, um, and is thus a work of love, right? So justice and love are not these opposing uh, forces, but they uh, are uh, woven together. And um, and so when I was initially thinking about this, I was thinking about this in, in, in connection with criminal justice, and I developed this, what I call a reintegrative theory of, of justice, where the aim of punishment is to, um, uh, well, it's a multi-layered aim, but the ultimate goal is um, reintegration of the criminal into the community of good citizens, which requires their moral transformation, which requ requires that they recognize the gravity of what they have done, uh, that they uh, engage in an appropriate kind of uh, penance, uh, and that they, um, and that the community recognizes their transformation and welcomes them back. Uh, once they have uh, made that transformation, and, and so so there's a there's two sides to this um, uh, process of 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 justice, right? A transformation uh, in the criminal, and a, a transformation in the attitude of society that allows for uh, reconciliation, right? Um, 
and uh, and I began thinking about well, uh, you know, applying this to uh, to Christian soteriology, and uh, it seemed to me that if we were sort of working this out in relation to Christian soteriology, um, that any postmortem punishment that God inflicted would uh, have to uh, come out of this place of love where its aim is to um, transform, uh, to purge sin from the, uh, the sinner and ultimately make them suitable uh, for uh, union with God. Um, and so if any are um, subjected to postmortem punishment, it would be for the sake of uh, uh, their salvation. It would be because there was something in them that was uh, inhibiting uh, their, uh, uh, their ability to receive divine grace um, and to be transformed, and that the purpose of punishment was to uh, make them ready. Um, and it was a fairly natural step from that to, uh, uh, to universalism. Uh, but, uh, once I took that tentative step, I, you know, started to encounter all kinds of other objections to universalism, uh, some of which we may, you know, uh, discuss. Um, and, and so, uh, so I sort of dug into those and, um, uh, and I mean, one of the, one of the issues is that, um, within the traditional doctrine of hell, there is, uh, the most traditional view, which, uh, conceives of hell as punitive, but then there is, um, um, what's sometimes called a separationist view of hell or what, uh, John Cronin and I have called the, the liberal doctrine of hell, uh, where uh, I mean, you find C.S. Lewis expressing this in terms of the gates of or the doors of hell are locked on the inside. Um, that uh, the damned damn themselves for their choices. It's not a punishment for sin, but it is uh, a state uh, they have chosen for themselves. Uh, and God, out of respect for their freedom, lets them have what they've chosen. Um, and so it's not punitive at all, uh, and, but rather uh, a result of human free choice and divine respect for that free choice as an expression of divine love, right? And, um, and so uh, a major sort of uh, part of my thinking about universalism relates to this view, right? And whether we can uh, make sense of universalism within the context of human free will and divine respect for human free will. Um, and again, we may, you know, say more about, uh, about that uh, in a bit. Um, but as I, uh, in terms of sort of the positive case for universalism that began to emerge, um, there were sort of several arguments for universalism that, uh, that sort of took center stage for me. Um, one is, uh, um, you know, just a straightforward, um, argument. God is perfectly loving and so would desire the salvation of all. And in fact, in first Timothy two, four, Right, we have a scriptural verse that says that God does desire that all be saved. Um, uh, God is almighty, uh, infinitely resourceful, and thus would have the resources to achieve what God desires. Uh, conclusion: uh, all are ultimately saved. Right, so uh, that's one sort of straightforward argument that if we talk about God's character. Um, who God is, God is love, God desires the salvation of all, um, uh, especially if we understand um, uh, God's justice as a part of God's love and hence 
uh, God's punitive justice as having um, a restorative and transformative aim, um, we, we get the view that God would want to save all uh, if God could. And then uh, you have an account of God's power, which says that God has the power to save all, right? And uh, if God is infinitely resourceful and almighty. Um, so that's, that's one sort of, sort of straightforward argument uh uh for universalism uh another one which is um the the subject of my most recent book is that heaven wouldn't be heaven for the saved if any were um uh eternally lost um the argument there finds uh the well i mean aquinas uh, brushed up against this argument, but quickly dismissed it uh, in ways I don't think are really satisfactory. Um, but uh, the 19th century theologian Schleiermacher sort of formulated the argument as a case for universalism when he said that um, the blessed in heaven being um, morally perfected, uh, their sympathy would extend to all. Uh, if their sympathy extended to all, they would feel sympathy for the damned. If they felt sympathy for the damned, that would be a disturbing element in their bliss uh, and they wouldn't be perfectly happy uh, and heaven wouldn't be the state of perfect joy that the tradition has, has typically held that it is. Um, and uh, uh, because of uh, my work in the Christian love ethic and my sort of deep dive into, well, what does Christian love lo look like? Uh, what is uh, the nature of agape? It's, it's, um, it's a love that is unconditional, that extends to even enemies um, and, uh, and particularly is responsive to anyone in need, right? The, the robbery victim on the Jericho Road. Um, that love would extend to the damned uh, because they are enemies in desperate need. Um, and if you love someone, uh, human love uh, values the good of the one loved. And, uh, and if you value someone's good and their good is fundamentally compromised, that's a source of pain. Uh, it can be a source of grief. Um, and so, uh, so this argument really struck me as, as having a lot of force that, um, heaven would not be heaven if any, uh, were e eternally damned. Um, so, uh, so that was my, uh, that was another sort of main line of argument that, uh, began to take shape for me as I was thinking about, uh, about these issues. Um, and uh, there are others, but I'll, I'll stop there, right? We have my sort of personal journey, which was through the lens of punishment and my understanding of what uh, punishment would be and what criminal justice would be, what justice more broadly would be within the context of a love ethic, and then applying that to, uh, uh, to God. Um, and then this sort of straightforward argument, God is all powerful, so God could save all if God wanted to. God is perfectly loving and so uh, would want to save all, so therefore God would save all. And then this argument from God's love for the blessed, as we might call it, uh, that God wants perfect joy for the blessed and that wouldn't happen if any were eternally damned, and so God would save all for that reason as well. Eric, thank you for all that. Um, one thing I'm wondering about here, one specific objection would be like, um, what about maybe like, someone might listen to what you said, Eric, and they're like, okay, there's a lot of like, maybe like philosophical arguments or whatnot, but like, mm -hmm. doesn't the Bible like clearly teach that like hell is real um, and things like this? And, and it's not like you didn't mention the Bible when you were talking, but I mean, it's mm -hmm. a common misconception, I think. Um, what would you say to someone who's like, Eric, that's a lot of philosophy, but like the Bible talks about hell and hell is real. So like, what are you doing? Yeah, so uh, the Bible is, of course, a very complicated text. And um, 
the thing with uh, the Bible, if you really read it uh, uh, with great care, is that you can find lots of, of material in the Bible that on a very straightforward reading, um, uh, or especially if you're reading it in English translation, if you're just uh, reading it straightforwardly, uh, seems to suggest that the doctrine of uh, eternal damnation is true. Um, but you also find lots of material in the scriptures uh, that on a straightforward reading uh, uh, suggests that all are saved. You also find um, material that uh, suggests that, uh, that some are uh, annihilated. Um, and uh, the reason why there are Christian annihilationists, Christian traditionalists, the, those who um, affirm an eternal hell, and Christian universalists is in part because uh, there are um, uh, passages and themes in scripture that support each one of these uh, positions. Um, and let me also, before digging a little bit more into that, uh, uh, preface this uh, by saying that while the arguments that I presented are uh, philosophical, uh, that doesn't mean that they aren't also scriptural, right? The, the starting point, the premises of the arguments come from uh, uh, the Christian scriptures and the, and the Christian tradition uh, that um, develops its understanding of the faith through engagement with scripture, right? So, so scripture is the, is the starting point in a sense for all of the arguments that I already talked about, right? The, the Christian understanding of, of, of love of what it is, is, you know, um, straight out of scripture. Uh, the, the idea that, um, God is love and uh, uh, God desires the salvation of all straight out of scripture. Um, the idea that God is almighty straight out of scripture, right? Uh, the, uh, the idea that uh, in heaven, every tear will be wiped away uh, and there will be no more mourning straight out of scripture, right? I mean, so, I mean, the point is that uh, that these arguments have their starting point in scripture, right? And it's, uh, it's um, uh, you know, reasoning from these starting points to what do they imply? And, um, uh, well, my conclusion is that they imply what, um, uh, what Paul asserts, right, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as an Adam all dies, so in Christ all will be made alive, right? Uh, or, I mean, I could keep, uh, or Lamentations, right? Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail, for men are not cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion, so great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. I could go on. There's lots of scriptural passages, right, that on their very straightforward reading, are universalist, right? Um, that passage from Paul, you know, in uh, 1 Corinthians is, is not the only one you find similar in, in, uh, in Romans, where Paul says that um, uh, uh, yeah, Romans 5, 18 and 19, and, um, and then uh, later passages in Romans 11, where straightforwardly he's saying all will be saved, right? Um, so, uh, but you also have these texts that on their straightforward reading uh, uh, are used to support a doctrine of eternal hell. Um, so what do you do with that, right? Is scripture itself inconsistent or are we just reading it wrong? Right. Well, let's suppose uh, we're just reading it wrong. Right. Uh, that what that means is that we don't have the right interpretation of one set of passages or the other. The traditional um, approach has been to take uh, 
the what I'll call the Hellist passages uh, as so obviously uh, correct in their plain meaning that we have to interpret away the Universalist passages. But um, um, what I want to suggest is that uh, if you look at the Universalist passages and you treat them as foundational, it's equally possible and perhaps even more plausible to um, uh, to say, well, maybe we got these Hellas passages wrong. And here I want to again um, refer back to um, that ultimately uh, uh, word in the definition of universalism, right? Universalism is the view that all are ultimately, ultimately saved. Um, so postmortem punishment is not incompatible with universalism uh, so long as it's not eternal. Um, now, uh, one of the issues uh, with uh, the scriptural interpretation of uh, what I'm calling the Hellas passages is that um, postmortem punishment is described as, in the original Greek, aeonian. Um, and that uh, term is translated in English translations as eternal. Um, and, uh, and I think in Latin translations, the, the Latin word for eternal was used to translate the original Greek. Um, but that original Greek term, strictly speaking, means something like of or pertaining to the age. Um, a, uh, some people argue it maybe means age long. Uh, there's others who, who say uh, that um, Aeonian is sometimes uh, used as a sort of adjective uh, equivalent to divine, right? So the um, eternal punishment would be divine punishment, right? It's the punishment that comes from the eternal God, right? Uh, or the punishment that proceeds from the one who is eternal. Um, and, um, but then there's others who say, well, this Aeonian, uh, because it doesn't strictly mean eternal in the, in the sense of the word in English, uh, might mean just age long. Um, the point is that there is, uh, especially when you lo look at the original Greek, uh, there's room for debate about precisely what uh, uh, the scope of this punishment is and, uh, and treating the punishment as unending, right, as a, a punishment that has no conclusion is a contestable interpretation of those texts. And given that it's a contestable interpretation of those texts, and you have these texts that say, um, uh, uh, for as in uh, Adam all uh, died, so in Christ all will be made alive. Uh, and we have other universalist passages. Um, perhaps what we should do is uh, interpret these uh, uh, texts that have traditionally been uh, taken to imply controversially an unending punishment as uh, implying a significant punishment that nevertheless has an end. Because if you interpret it that way, which is a possible interpretation, then you don't have a conflict with the universalist passages. And we have a, uh, a theology which holds that um, uh, there is a difference at the end of this life between uh, those who have, um, uh, who have repented uh, who have turned to God, who have um, uh, taken on the, um, uh, the cloak of Christ's righteousness, um, who have, uh, however you want to put it, accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. There's a difference between uh, those and those who haven't um, uh, in that uh, those who haven't have to go to hell, go through hell first before they are ultimately saved. Um, 
But uh, but the final end is the same for all. Um, that is a reading of scripture that uh, that takes that instead of interpreting away the universalist language in Paul to make it fit the presumption that post-mortem uh, penalty for the unregenerate never ends, uh, interrogates the, the, the interpretation that post-mortem uh, punishment uh, never ends uh, in light of uh, a careful reading of the original Greek. Uh, and then says, well, given the um, uh, ambiguity of, of the duration of this punishment in the original Greek, uh, and given uh, Paul's clear universalist uh, statements, uh, that which is truest to scripture, which is most faithful to scripture, is not to interpret away Paul's claims to fit our um, uh, eternal hell prejudices, but rather uh, to take Paul seriously and interpret those hell passages uh, in a way that fits with what Paul was saying, right? So that's the, uh, uh, that's the Christian universalist uh, scriptural argument. Now, of course, there's lots of room for debate about this, but the point is that there is room for debate. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all that, Eric. And I think that's really helpful to lay that out for all of us. Um, I'm curious now, we have like 15 minutes or so. Um, maybe what are some of like the other like stronger objections to universalism that you've seen? Yeah, so I gestured towards um, um, uh, there are some of these already. Um, but let me quickly talk about the justice objection. Um, because uh, not everyone shares the understanding of divine justice that uh, that I sketched out earlier, um, in which justice is an expression of divine love uh, that is about um, um, uh, you know motivating the sinner to recognize the gravity of their sin. Uh, to repent of their sin, to do penance for their sin, to take on a, a, a punishment as penance, uh, to work off their sin as a way of healing them of sin, right? Uh, not everyone accepts that view uh, of, of justice. Some people have a more strict retributive view uh, where it's just intrinsically fitting that the... Um, uh, the perpetrator of an offense experience a degree of suffering proportional to the severity of their offense, right? Um, and um, uh, while I don't think that view of, of justice is the best fit with their scriptural portrait of God, um, uh, it is a very traditional view, and uh, it's one that... Uh, one has to take seriously. Um, but uh, fortunately for the universalist, um, that view of justice is no impediment to universalism. Um, and let me, let me uh, articulate why. Um, in order for justice in that sense to demand eternal punishment, a punishment without end, the offense that uh, is committed um, uh, by the sinner has to be of infinite or endless gravity, right? Infinitely severe. Um, if it's not, then uh, that view of justice is no impediment to universalism, obviously, because the punishment could be imposed, uh, the demands of justice met, and then once the demands of justice have been met, the person could still be saved. Um, but what if you uh, accept that, as St. Anselm did, the, um, uh, the gravity of sin is infinite because it's um, uh, uh, an offense against God who is infinitely, uh, uh, has infinite worth, right? So 
an offense against a being of infinite worth is infinitely grave. Um, what then? Well, Anselm uh, argued that if that's the case, and he thought it was, you've got a problem because then the creature has committed an offense of infinite gravity and justice demands that they make it up to God. But as finite creatures, they can't. Um, and uh, even on the level of, um, of just enduring a penalty um, of uh, infinite magnitude, they can't. Think about it this way. Let's suppose that, um, I mean, if I'm a finite being, I can only suffer so much at any moment. So in order to endure an infinite penalty, uh, we would need to string together infinitely many moments uh, of finite suffering. But the problem with uh, infinitely many moments of finite suffering is that we never get to the end of the infinite sequence. So we never reach a point at which the demands of justice have been met. So if sin is infinitely grave and demands an infinite uh, 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 punishment, a punishment of infinite severity, um, uh, the problem is that the demands of justice simply cannot be met by creatures, right? Uh, but Anselm then says, but fortunately God is resourceful and came up with a way to meet the demands of justice, right? And uh, we get Anselm's theory of the vicarious atonement, right? Uh, God became incarnate uh, and um, suffered uh, and died on a cross. And this uh, suffering and death on the cross was uh, God meeting the demands of justice on humanity's behalf, right? Um, so, uh, on Anselm's view, the demands of justice have been met vicariously for us by, uh, God himself, right? And, um, and if that's the case, then justice doesn't, a, you know, impose an impediment to the salvation of all, um, it's true that one might adopt the view, and this leads to what I think is the more serious uh, or the, uh, the more important objection. One might adopt the view that in order to enjoy the benefits of uh, the atonement, one must subjectively appropriate it. So if one doesn't subjectively appropriate it, then... Uh, one is still under the law and still uh, subject to the demands of justice and all of that. Um, but what that means is that uh, if all do subjectively appropriate it, then uh, the demands of justice have been met. So if universalism is true, if all subjectively appropriate it, um, then the demands of justice have been met and God's love has been fully expressed to all as well. Um, but if some eternally reject um, uh, this, uh, refuse to subjectively receive uh, uh, Christ's atoning work, um, if some do that, then neither the demands of justice nor love will be met, right? Because God wants all to be saved. That's what God's love calls for. God's justice requires that the penalty be paid. If any eternally hold out against God, uh, that means that justice will never be met, right? Because even if they suffer forever, they will never reach the end, at which point they will have met the demands of justice. They just can't do it. And God's love will be eternally thwarted, right? So if any eternally hold out against God, that means that God's justice and God's love will fail to find full expression in creation. Um, so it's only if all ultimately do, right, uh, repent uh, and receive the merit to Christ's work that God's justice and love are fully manifested in creation. So it's only if universalism is true that God's justice and love are sort of fully realized in creation. 
And this is where the free will problem comes in. Well, maybe that means that God just can't uh, fully manifest God's justice and love in creation, that there is an impediment to doing so, namely God's respect for freedom. Right? God's respect for creaturely freedom is sufficiently great that God will not uh, override the free choices of creatures and these free creatures, uh, if they choose to eternally reject God's grace, um, will be mired in sin forever uh, and there's nothing God can do about it. Right, And so, uh, though, and those who are mired in sin forever, that's hell, right? Uh, and um, and so ultimately, what we're then led to is this uh, free will argument for hell that um, that says that uh, it's out of respect for creaturely freedom that God just has to sit by and watch his creation fall short, right, of what God desires for it, fall short both in terms of justice and in terms of love. Right, uh, because a world in which uh, creatures eternally reject the vicarious atonement uh, is a world in which the demands of justice go eternally unmet and God's loving aims are eternally unrealized. Um, but maybe God just, God's hands are tied, right, by the demands of respect for freedom, right? Uh, that God's love for creatures uh, requires that God respect their freedom. And so, um, uh, God's hands are tied. Um, well, I don't think God's hands are tied, even if we adopt the view that God has to respect our freedom, um, uh, uh that that is an essential expression of divine love. Um, and the reason why I don't think God's hands are tied is, um, well, I mean, there's freedom is a con complex concept uh, and there are different ways of, of, of construing freedom. So I'm, um, uh, again, um, going to have to sort of make some choices here uh, because again, you know, the argument here is, is again, disjunctive. Uh, if you construe freedom in one way, um, Clearly, God can uh, save all while respecting freedom. If, uh, if freedom is construed in the um, what what John Crone and I call rational freedom, where uh, to be free uh, is uh, to be able to choose based on the weight of reasons, as opposed to being causally determined. Right, so. So you, you to be free is to be uh, not causally determined to go one way or another, but be able to sort of look at the reasons and the arguments and the evidence and deliberate, right? And then based on that deliberation, make a choice. Um, if freedom looks like that, uh, well, here's the thing that in lots and lots of situations with respect to lots and lots of choices, the reasons and the evidence and the arguments are mixed. If you, uh, even if you have uh, a full understanding of what they are, um, but when it comes to uh, accepting the gift of divine saving grace and rejecting it, um, every possible reason, uh, if you unless you're in the grip of ignorance, every possible reason uh, that would guide your deliberations uh, would favor accepting divine grace. Um, and so if, um, and so th this is basically Tom Talbot's argument that uh, the only reason why you wouldn't accept divine grace um, uh, is if you weren't truly free. Uh, you will either be in the grip of ignorance or in the grip of deception or uh, being causally determined to behave the way you do by uh, bondage to sin or bondage to some controlling affective state. Uh, all of these are impediments to real freedom. 
And all God needs to do to save all is to strip them of ignorance, deception, and bondage to sin. And arguably, that's what hell is about, right? Hell confronts you with the truth of what you've been chosen, stripping you of your ignorance and deception. And the punishments of hell aim to break the grip of uh, sin on you so that you're genuinely free. And once you're genuinely free, uh, you would have every reason to choose God and no reason to reject God. And therefore, you would inevitably but freely choose God. Um, that's Talbot's argument. Um, but um, there are some troubles with it, or some problems with it, uh, rooted it to some uh, to some extent in the in the notion of freedom and the debatability of uh, uh, of that the conception of freedom on which it's premised, but also um, it assumes that um, prior to salvation you can be free of all ignorance and deception uh, because uh, if it's only once you are saved that all ignorance and deception is gone, uh, then the only way for God to bring you into a state in which you are free to choose God is for God to save you, right? And then God would be saving you without your free uh, choice, right? But what if God really values uh, your freedom so much that um, that God um, uh, won't override even the impaired freedom of the pre-saved creature, right? Then we might, uh, uh, then, then the free will challenge to universalism still has some legs. Um, but uh, this is where... Uh, John and I call the infinite opportunity argument comes into play. Um, basically, and I know we're running out of time, so I'm just going to um, uh, summarize it quickly. Um, the infinite opportunity argument says um, the choice to accept um, or reject divine grace needn't be a limited time offer. It can be a standing offer. And in fact, if God loves us, it would be a standing offer. And if the meeting the demands of justice depends upon us accepting divine grace, it would be a standing offer. God wouldn't cut off, uh, say, okay, I'm gonna end the opportunity for my love and justice to be fully realized in the world. No, God would, Remain, keep it a, an open or standing offer in order to ensure that justice and love are fully manifested in creation, right? And so if it's a standing offer, then uh, then the creature doesn't have uh, to, to be eternally damned, would have to reject God infinitely many times. Um, but if at each opportunity, the um, the person is genuinely truly still free right if this is if if freedom is the only impediment then we have to assume this person is is free at every choice opportunity and if they're free at every choice opportunity that means there's a real possibility that they will accept at every choice opportunity and if there's a real possibility that they will accept at every choice opportunity and there are infinitely many of those choice opportunities then by the mathematically the mathematics of infinity it becomes mathematically certain that they will at some point accept and so uh on on that uh infinite opportunity argument we get uh to the conclusion that god has a way even a way even uh, while respecting freedom to save all, simply make uh, make salvation a standing offer, and ensure that creatures remain free to choose it. Um, so anyway, uh, that's the main outline of the um, uh, response to the free will concern about uh, about universalism. Well, thank you so much, Eric. It's been so helpful for you to uh, 
overview everything. And I think it's helpful for listeners to kind of understand universalism, what it is, objections and things like that. So this has been great. Thank you. Um, Eric, how can people like follow you, connect with you, things like that, if they're interested in your work in Christian universalism and whatnot? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I mentioned uh, this book, uh, God's Final Victory uh, by a John Cronin and myself, where we lay out uh, these arguments in in painstaking detail. Um, uh, I have another book on the problem of heavenly grief that will be coming out sometime in the next year, um, depending on how long it takes to for editing and and all of that to to go through. Um, uh, I have a uh, a blog called The Piety That Lies Between. I have not been very good at maintaining that blog in recent uh, years. I used to be much more um, uh, faithful in maintaining that blog. But um, uh, but if you just Google the pi- my name and The Piety That Lies Between, you can find it. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that I have... Uh, a science fiction novel uh, that released a couple of months ago called So Eden Sank to Grief uh, that um, uh, that touches on some of these themes in a, a, a more fictional uh, framework. Um, so uh, if people like uh, science fiction stories, um, uh, it's my sort of attempt to be the uh c.s lewis of universalist christianity or something like that i don't know yeah that's awesome eric um wait did i cut you off is there anything else you wanted to say no well thank you so much for coming on the podcast today eric it's been a lot of fun talking with you um i'll leave some links down below where people can follow eric connect with eric um and yeah this is it here in projects if you're new to the podcast we encourage you to leave a like subscribe all that fun stuff uh, and if you value the podcast, you can support it at patreon.com slash inhuman projects. But Eric, one last time, thank you so much for coming on. It's been great. It was my pleasure. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope you have a good one. And God bless. We'll catch you next time.